problem of evil is one of the most difficult theological religious questions that's addressed in the Bible. And perhaps the thing that makes it most maddening, most difficult, most trying for us is the fact that it has no obvious or easy solution. And this problem of evil is something that emerges exclusively within the domain of monotheism. And it's worth considering that fact before we go further into the book of Job, the book of the Bible which most explicitly addresses the problem of evil. Think of it this way. In any polytheistic tradition, let's take the example of ancient Greece, there's good and evil, there's an understanding of right and wrong, but it's hard to know to whom we can assign blame for the existence of evil or any specific evil in the world. And also, it's not clear that there's anyone to blame at all. In other words, when something bad happens within the Greek tradition, for example, it could have happened because Zeus was asleep, because Zeus was on earth chasing mortal women, because he was occupied with Hera, or doing something else. In other words, there's always the possibility that God will be distracted, even the chief of the pantheon in any polytheistic system. Once you have God distracted, once God is, on, is neither omnipotent nor omniscient, which is necessarily the case in a polytheistic system, the problem of evil becomes easy to solve. Somebody else was doing something evil while the main god was occupied or asleep or somewhere else. The situation radically changes when we move to monotheism. The, uh, I think it was Harry Truman that once had on his desk a, a little sign that said, the buck stops here. Well, once you get to monotheism, on Yahweh's desk, the buck stops there. And we can't blame anyone else for the, for the existence of evil in the world. It can only somehow be Come, be, be coming from Yahweh, or somehow Yahweh is implicated in the problem, and yet because of Yahweh's perfect moral status, because Yahweh is completely good and has none of the temptations that human beings are subject to, the problem is, how could perfect Yahweh and create a, a world that's imperfect that contains evil within it? So in other words, it's worth your consideration from the outset that the problem of evil is exclusively a problem of monotheism. There's no other system of religious thought which generates the problem in quite this radical form. Assuming that Yahweh is in charge of the universe, that he made the universe, and that Yahweh is perfectly virtuous and perfectly good, the question emerges then, how is it that Yahweh can allow for evil? And there's no obvious or easy answer to that. And one of the reasons why people continually raise this question, while it seems that we're always, why it seems that we're always under the the burden of the, this question is that evil is a simple fact of human life. If, assuming that we are within the tradition of Western monotheism, we search the scripture, perhaps with less than satisfactory results, when we try and figure out why it is that evil confronts us in the world, why it is that a perfect God would generate a world that's less than perfect. How is it that a perfect God generated us? We're so obviously and visibly imperfect, the distance the gap between us and the divine is inscrutable, it's uncertain, and we search around for ways of formulating the problem, and from that perhaps we'll formulate an answer or a series of answers. Now the book of Job is the one book in the Hebrew Bible which most explicitly addresses the problem of evil. And it does it in a very radical form, and it does it in a sort of parable form. It does, it has a, for the most part, the, the text of Job is relatively smooth and continuous, despite the fact, it, the fact that it was redacted over a period of some centuries, probably post-exilic, um, and despite the fact that the story itself dates back to the earliest phases of Semitic uh, myth and literature. It goes back certainly before the year 1000. Um, the story itself is elegant in its simplicity and its directness, and it is one of the most bewildering and intriguing of, sto of the biblical stories. Start out, frame the scene. First part of the book of Job, first chapter, actually chapter and a half, gives us a narrative frame scene, which is in and, in and of itself almost completely enigmatic. We are set in a place that isn't determinate. We don't know exactly what the location is. All we know about the place is that Yahweh is there, and Yahweh is always surrounded by the various minions and hosts of Yahweh. And among these angels, divine worshipers, these spirits that are connected to Yahweh, Satan is there, the devil, the tempter. The problem is, before we even get to the story, what is Satan doing there? Why is it that he converses with Yahweh? How is it that Yahweh and Satan seem to be on such good terms? Satan would seem then not yet to be entirely the personification of evil, a tempter, 
a seducer, but he somehow seems connected with God. And that by itself, before we actually get into the story of Job, when we come back, we may find this to be the most enigmatic part of it. How is it that symbolically we have Satan in among, within God's heaven, within God's domain, in such an intimate and personal connection to God? And Satan is being very devilish. In the Hebrew Bible, Satan doesn't make too many appearances. We get the snake in the Garden of Eden. We get a, an occasional reference. But for the most part, Satan is going to make his big appearance in Western religion in the Greek Testament. Here, he is making a cameo appearance, but the appearance is quite important. He and God are up in heaven, and they look down. I assume that heaven is always up, that being the, uh, the symbolism always connected to it. They look down, and they see Job. And it turns out that Yahweh likes Job. Yahweh likes Job a great deal. And what he likes particularly about Job is that Job is Yahweh's faithful servant. Job never blasphemes. Job is rigorous in his adherence to the law. He is virtuous in his dealing with other people. And he shows the appropriate respect to Yahweh. He, among all the people of the earth, is Yahweh's particularly uh, chosen individual. He is Yahweh's faithful servant. If you had to choose one instantiation of the image of biblical faith, tested beyond what would, we would think to be the limits of human endurance, Job is that great image. You might want to say that Job adopts the characteristic stance of biblical philosophy, the stance of absolute resignation. But he only gets pushed into the stance of resignation gradually and unwillingly. And as is the case with the other chastisements sent by Yahweh, there's always a reason for it. And at the, at the end of this chastisement, we will have moved up. We will have ratcheted up to a new moral level, to a new understanding of the relationship between the human and the divine. So Job is God's faithful servant. He's down. He's married to Mrs. Job. They have children. And of course, at the time that this story is generated. Job is a wealthy man, but it's so old, it's so archaic, it goes so far back into human history. Money hasn't been invented yet. Remember, money gets invented, coin gets invented about 700 BC in Lydia. Well, Job obviously goes back to Semitic traditions that are from the earlier millennium, prior to that. So Job is a wealthy man, which means that he has lots of goats, lots of sheep. That's what it means to be a wealthy man back then. Probably lots of slaves, large family. One of the things that you should emphasize and think about when you are looking at the Hebrew Bible in particular, in particular is that God's blessing, when God blesses someone, what he, he, the sign of that blessing is the fact that they get to live a long time and they have surrounded by lots of living things, and in particular a family. For example, Methuselah gets to live to be an enormous number of years. No, Moses li lives to be very old. Uh, Noah lives to be very old. If you live to be old and you have a large family and you have a large amount of possessions, that's the, and particularly because possessions are living things, that's the sign of God's abundance. That's the sign of God's bliss blessing. So Job is described as being God's faithful servant. He also has the appropriate trappings to be understood as God's faithful servant. God makes a man prosperous and happy, and for that reason he's given flocks and a family and things like that. Now, Joe, uh, Satan and God are talking up in heaven. And I always wondered, what does Satan and God talk about? I mean, how is it that this frame scene works? It's perhaps proper not to ask too many pointed questions about this initial frame scene, because although it's very necessary for, our, for the later kind of uh, moral message that's being told, if you ask too many questions you'll get you, uh, about the relation early between Satan and God, you'll find that it's more and more enigmatic, and the solutions turn out to be, well, not entirely satisfactory. We'll come back to that. Satan and God are talking, and they see Job, the faithful servant down there, and he's got his flocks, he's got his family, he's a happy man, he's a virtuous man, he does what God tells him to do, he shows the appropriate respect to God. Satan says, he doesn't really like you. He doesn't really admire you, God, for what you are. He doesn't really respect or worship you. Job only goes through the motions of acting as if he were a religious, morally faithful man because of the things you give him. You give him flocks, you give him a family, you give him a wife, you give him all the nice things in life. If you, Yahweh, had not given him great stuff, Job wouldn't like you and he wouldn't follow you. He wouldn't be uh, your faithful servant. Now, again, this is a peculiar case. Job is trying to bait Yahweh, and it seems like Yahweh goes for it. It's very hard to understand why Yahweh would, would or, or uh, Satan baits Yahweh, rather, and it's hard to see why Yahweh would go for that. Why would Yahweh allow himself to be provoked by Satan, who is inexplicably up in his divine court? Well, we'll take it the argument a little bit further. 
God actually replies and says, well, if you don't believe that Job is my faithful servant, go down and test Job. Satan, from this perspective, is the tester. He's the one who practically ascertains the inner core. We are moving from the outside observation of Job and his behavior and his ritual observance to the inner core of the man. We can only do that by symbolically stripping away the externalities, his family, his possessions, all the other good things in life. So in some ways, it seems that even Satan is doing God's will, not that he is being, that he's provoking God, but rather that God is going to reveal the difference between the inner and the outer, between the attitude of, uh, of religious faith as a matter of soul, and the mere going through the motions of religious observance on the outside. So Satan is going to allow us to have a look into the soul of Job, into the soul of God's faithful servant. And he does that by engaging in this colloquy with God, which results in Satan going down and doing these desperate evils to Job. So Satan comes down and he kills the flocks that Job had depended on. He sends in invaders to enslave and, and, kill, his ch and kill his children. And Job looks around and says, my possessions, my family, everything that was important to me, gone. Almost everything that was important to me. There's one thing that was important to me that's still there. It's God, but I do not know why God sends me these afflictions. Job does not blaspheme. He is not willing to hang the blame on Yahweh. He is willing to acknowledge that Yahweh runs history. He is willing to accept the fact that Yahweh sends chastisements for whatever reasons he has, but he doesn't understand the reason behind it. If you think about that chapter from uh, Isaiah where it says, uh, my thoughts are not your thoughts, well, very much the book of Job is in, written in that vein. My thoughts are not your thoughts, and Job is unable to fathom the point that Yahweh is making, the reasons behind Yahweh's, the, the afflictions Yahweh sent. So Job is sitting there in the ashes of his life, regretting the terrible misfortunes he's found himself in. Mrs. Job, the only one left in his family, has come to give him advice, and her theological advice is, curse God and die. Now, that's not a very hopeful or cheery sort of a message. And we would hope for the, 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 that the Bible might offer us more solace than curse God and die. And in fact, Mrs. Job is a sort of paragon for the lack of religious faith. For the person who accepts the world as it appears, she is the person for whom appearance and reality are the same thing, for whom inside and outside are the same thing. What is important about Job, what illustrates the spiritual depth of Job, is that Job has an inside, a soul, as well as an outside. So even though his outside is afflicted, even though his children are killed, his flocks are taken away, he suffers enormous misfortune, that's all external to Job, and Job is willing to say, I do not blaspheme, I am not willing to curse God and die, I will never curse God under any circumstances. Well, up in heaven, this is making a big hit, God and Satan are watching Job's afflictions, and Satan says, double or nothing. Let's see if we can do it this way. Satan says to God, the reason why Job is not willing to blaspheme is because he really never cared about possessions and really never cared about his family. None of those things really matter. Job is not really your faithful servant. He merely appears to be. And the reason why he is going through the motions of acting as if he were Yahweh's faithful servant is because Yahweh has not stricken him physically, has not sent physical disease, physical pain to Job directly. He's more than willing to be unsympathetic to his family and not care about his possessions, so long as you don't get him in the body, which is where it really counts. Once again, it seems that God takes the bait. God says, gives Satan license to go back down and afflict Job with boils and sores from head to toe. So he's covered with terrible wounds and sores and he's wretched and unhappy and his wife is looking at him wondering, why don't you curse God and die? Job bears up under the suffering. Job says, look, I'm God's faithful servant, despite the fact that my life is ruined, that I've lost everything that is important in the world to a man, and I've even lost my own physical health, I will not curse Yahweh, I will not presume to judge God. I understand what my position is in the world, I understand what his position is, I think that I, am, uh, that I, that I haven't done anything to deserve or merit this chastisement, but I myself don't know, and I, whatever happens, I know that I will remain faithful to the covenant with Yahweh, and I will remain God's faithful servant. So we find ourselves at an impasse. 
Job is in a wretched condition. Satan seems to be quite happy because he's doing all kinds of evil here in the world. And perhaps the most satanic thing about Satan, the most, the most, I don't know, Promethean in its futility, is the fact that he makes a wager with God. What are your chances of winning a bet with God? Very small. As a matter of fact, they're non-existent. He's God. God knows how the story ultimately comes out because he knows everything. Which means that it isn't even possible for Satan ever to win this argument. The outcome is never in doubt in God's mind. He is outside the realm of temporality. So perhaps the most satanic thing about Satan is that he is such an apostle of futility. He grasps the possibility of tormenting Job to no effect because he knows that there's no way of telling God that he's wrong. If God says that Job is his faithful servant, God's right. <laughs> there's no doubt about that. That's the way the Hebrew Bible works. If that's the case then, we go back and look at Satan and we look at the image of Promethean futility. I mean, it's really Miltonic, the, the image of Satan we get here. He would rather do evil on earth than reconcile himself with God in heaven. He knows it's futile. He knows it's not possible to do any but evil to Job, and the evil will not ultimately prove him to be right. God couldn't be wrong. And that doesn't even slow Satan down. So Satan is not just the tempter. Satan is the image of Promethean futility, of humanism in the sense that it never achieves or reaches or longs for, never gestures at the divine. It's strictly surface, strictly body, strictly alienated from the divine being. So Satan is a very fascinating character here, not so much because of what he says, but because of the implications of his actions. And the frame scene, the scenes with, and the scenes with Satan here in the book of Job will repay a very careful and conscientious reading. This frame scene is full of interesting and suggestive gestures at the relationship between good and evil as it's understood in the biblical tradition. So we have a sort of Miltonic Promethean Satan who does evil, particularly to good men like Job, because he enjoys doing evil, not because he could ever possibly prove God wrong. Such is the nature of satanic futility. Well, in keeping with this theme of satanic futility, Job's friends come for a visit. And Job has kind of know-it-all friends, friends whose pretensions towards omniscience, in this case theological knowledge, are not only unpleasant, but they move in the direction of the blasphemous. Job's three friends are theologians. They believe that they understand the divine mind. They not only believe that they understand God's purposes in this world, but they think that they can justify God's ways to man. They are rather Miltonic theologians. John, uh, Job's three friends believe that they can discern in the pattern of human events, and which they can only see at the surface, of course, the hidden meaning, God's hidden purposes in the chastisements that get sent out. These, in some ways, are not only would-be theologians, but would-be prophets. Well, it turns out that a colloquy emerges which focuses our attention on the problem of evil as it's presented in the biblical tradition, and his theological friends turn out to be theological wannabes. It turns out to be impossible to discern God's ways and discern God's plans, and there is a, a cycle of colloquies between Job and his friends. Now his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, come to commiserate, but their commiseration is not entirely sympathetic. They are not only trying to discern God's ways, and they're not only implicitly alleging that they understand God's plan for the universe, which is what every theodicy discloses, they're also implicitly suggesting that because they have not been afflicted, and Job has, that they are more righteous than he is. If we work on the assumption, which the three friends are assuming, that God sends things only for sufficient purposes, and that these sufficient purposes are discernible by human reason alone, well then the fact that Job has his family killed, loses his possessions, and has these terrible diseases, is prima facie evidence that Job is guilty of some great transgression. If it's not possible to work back from the brute fact of the transgression to some hidden sin, then the whole project of theodicy breaks down. That means that it's impossible to know God's ways. Ultimately, God will remain inscrutable. So, Job's friends have an agenda because they are justifying God's ways, not just to man in general, but specifically to Job, but also, and this is what's noteworthy and what you ought to pay careful attention to when you read this passage, this central part of Job, they are justifying themselves.
If Job has been afflicted and they have not, that means that they are good and Job is wicked. If they do not succeed in showing that Job's affliction comes from his wickedness, then implicitly they fail to justify themselves. That means that the fact that they're not afflicted does not demonstrate that they are virtuous in the sight of God. So there is a, a powerful element of human pride. There's a powerful desire to justify oneself built into these theological wannabes. And there is a very deep and rather caustic message about the possibilities and parameters and circumstances of theology and theodicy built right into the story of Job. There, the failure of the three friends to construct an adequate theodicy, to comprehend thoroughly the mind of God, means that in the long run, it's not possible for any of us. None of us can justify ourselves in God's sight, and none of us can know God's inscrutable purposes for the world. So now let's look at the colloquies they engage in. Um, the, and the, 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 the central part of the book of Job is roughly from chapter 3 to chapter 31, and there are three sets uh, of colloquies and three friends, and three is of course always a very auspicious number in the Bible. A little later on when I talk about the book of John uh, and the, the Gospel of John, I will talk about the significance in numerology and number symbolism in the Bible. But for now, just consider the fact that three is a heavenly number. Three is a very auspicious number. And the three sets of three always suggest that we're gradually moving up levels towards some final revelation, which we will get towards the end. Now, Job and his friends, uh, Job's friends come to him and they say, there are a couple of possibilities. Possibility number one is that you yourself have sinned and you're lying to us. Job says that he's not and takes a whole series of oaths to the effect that he's not. Key point being that Job, since he is God's faithful servant, will not take Yahweh's name in vain. When he swears all these oaths to, by the name of the sacred name of Yahweh, to the effect that he has not, to the best of his knowledge, done anything to merit these sufferings, we are, again, at an impasse. Job's friends do not dare take such a corresponding oath to the effect that they themselves are justified. So we have a tremendous tension building up. A second try that Job's friends take is that perhaps your family has done some secret sin because at this point in time, the idea of individual guilt was connected to the idea of collective guilt. There was the possibility of not simply being guilty for your specific sins, but carrying with you a burden of guilt from your ancestors. Think of the sin of Adam. Adam and Eve and the fall in the garden means that we are all depraved. We are all born with original sin. So you must emphasize the fact and, consider, and remember the fact that Job's guilt, if there is such a thing, may not be individual. He himself may not have done anything. It may be collective guilt. A final attempt by the, the friends is to say that, well, perhaps you yourself have not done it knowingly, but perhaps in the process of engaging in your usual activities, you have unintentionally transgressed. It turns out that Job rebuffs that too and has an argument to meet each and every accusation presented by the friends. A couple of things to consider. God's accusation and human accusations are fundamentally different. Human accusations are unreliable. Human accusations, particularly when they are made individually, are dubious. Uh, within the numerology of the Bible, the number two is always the number of society. If you go back to things like a Deuteronomy, the number of witnesses you need to make a case stick in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomistic law is two. You have to have multiple witnesses. Each one of his friends comes in with a separate allegation against Job. You don't have the requisite number of witnesses, and these are only hypothetical transgressions in any case. The point here is that Job's friends are not justified in the sight of God, and for that reason they are not morally equipped to accuse Job. Uh, the, idea of ju the idea that judgment is the province of God and his inscrutable handing out of punishment and its opposite is not to be understood or completely comprehended by human beings. This is what I would call a philosophy of resignation. I would be inclined to say that if all of Job's friends, who appear to think themselves religious men, and who appear to think that they are knowledgeable about religious issues, if it turns out that they are unable to know either the state of their own soul, or the state of Job's soul, or God's plan for the universe, it will, fo it will follow then that the God Yahweh, the God which we worship in the text of the Hebrew Bible, is at some level inscrutable, mysterious. This is the opposite conception of the world 
to the conception of the world worked out by the ancient Greeks? For the Greeks, it's knowable, it's rational. For the Hebrews, it is fundamentally unknowable, it is fundamentally mysterious. The thing that will be important about this mystery is that insofar as people conceptualize the world as being a mysterious entity, not ultimately susceptible to rational analysis and comprehension, that on, then and only then will faith become a virtue. If you think the opposite, the Greek idea that the world is rationally knowable, faith is an absolute vice. So it is only if you make the assumption that Yahweh is ultimately unknowable, that human beings are incapable of justifying themselves or of understanding God's plans for the universe except through special dispensation and special revelation, then you have the foundation upon which you can build vir uh, a, a, a virtue called faith. You need that idea of mystery. You need God's inscrutability for faith to be a virtue. And that's why it's only a virtue, only a theological virtue, in the tradition that comes out of Jerusalem rather than Athens. Well, Job is engaging in this deep and very perplexing and rather painful colloquy with his friends, if that's what you want to call them. And at the end of this uncertain and inconclusive dialogue, a new figure emerges. Now, the third colloquy between Job and his, and his friends is incomplete. One of his friends speaks, and then there's a small section from a, a second friend. The third friend never gets his chance to talk. I would venture the conjecture here that the text is corrupt, that in the process of doing these redactions, that probably we want to give the third friend another speech and, and then take away one of the three consecutive speeches that Job gives there. So do keep in mind when you're reading this the fact that the redaction isn't perfect and that although it's a lot more sophisticated than the redactions that we saw in Gilgamesh, we are still a long way from having a perfectly smooth, coherent narrative. Now, the end of this series of ambiguous colloquies, we get a new figure. And he's obviously a redaction too, and his name is Elihu. Elihu is a young man who apparently has spiritual and moral wisdom. The first and most indisputable sign of his moral wisdom is that he knows how to keep his mouth shut. Oh, and that's wonderful. There are so few people in Scripture that know how to shut up. And Elihu is great for that. He's been sitting here all through this colloquy, listening to these gentlemen, or Job and his friends, who are a generation older, express their views on justification and on God's plan for the universe and on the meaning of evil, on the connection between good and evil and the problem of evil in human life. And he has found these reflections more and more provoking because it seems that the friends are implying that they understand God's ways and they are implying that they are justified and Elihu believes this to be blasphemous. He's restrained himself out of respect for their age, but the third time around he's becoming rather worn and rather concerned about the tendency here. He's even more concerned about Job himself. Job insists again and again and again that he has done nothing to deserve God's chastisement. Implicitly what he is saying is that he is capable of judging his own moral status and if God sees fit to chastise him, he is in a position to tell God that it is unmerited. The point is here that Elihu comes back and reproves Job. He says, look, if you are morally virtuous, then you completely accept whatever cards God deals you. And if God has decided to send you chastisement, if he intends to kill your family, or if he intends to kill even you, you must accept that with a complete and utter resignation. You do not shake your fist at God the way, say, Prometheus does towards Zeus. A Yahweh, being the one God of monotheism, is not only absolutely powerful, he's absolutely morally virtuous, and what Yahweh does is right, by definition. It is apodictic. There is nothing to talk about. So if Job is going to insist, on the one hand, that, Yah that he believes in Yahweh, and that he is God's faithful servant, and that he is, in fact, consistent with Yahweh's demands, he cannot at the same time say that he is blameless, that he is sinless in the sight of Yahweh. He is in no position to judge Yahweh. Insofar as he does, it is blasphemous. Insofar as he thinks that he doesn't deserve punishment, he does. Anyone who thinks that they are justified in God's sight is mistaken. Anyone who thinks that God might capriciously or arbitrarily or pointlessly give out suffering in the world defames and blasphemes the name of Yahweh. This is the great transgression of Job. In a way, Job was tried and found wanting. He was tried because on the outside he appears to be God's faithful servant. In all of his behavior, and all of his actions, God finds nothing to find fault with. Or there's nothing to find fault with in his behavior that Satan can see. Both God and Satan look down and say, that's my faithful servant. We look within 
And we see a man who is somewhat proud of his own moral status, who likes being God's faithful servant, and kind of pats himself on the back about the possibility of, re of reconciling himself with the law of Yahweh. So there's a certain degree of what I might call hubris, or perhaps even better, self-satisfaction in Job's insistence again and again and again, even to the point of swearing oaths, using the name of Yahweh, to the fact that he is morally justified. The point is that anyone who thinks that they're morally justified isn't. Anyone who thinks they understand God's mind does not. And the Lord thy God reveals himself when he wants to and how he wants to. And anyone who objects to that is not a real faithful servant of Yahweh. So I would be inclined to say that, first of all, that Elihu is probably redacted from another tradition. If you can imagine that this, this problem of evil has been floating around ever since monotheism was developed, or gradually developed, and the story of Job, the righteous man who is tried, probably has its Mesopotamian or Near Eastern antecedents. It seems like a most likely possibility. Wisdom literature, which is the way Job is classed, along with Proverbs and things like that, have many precursors in ancient Mesopotamian literature. So there's a good chance that it's a real old problem. What the religion of Yahweh is going to add to this is Elihu. I can imagine scribes redacting the story of Job, not quite getting the uh, last little colloquy with the, with the three friends correct, but knowing that we have to bring in Elihu. We need some sort of angel ex machina or Elihu ex machina. Somebody has to come ex machina to show that Job really isn't justified. If we are capable of showing that Job is not justified, that means that God's justice is preserved, and it means that we are drawing a distinction between the external, the ritual observance, the actions people engage in, and the internal facts of soul. Although Job has been going through all the motions, Job is proud of his spiritual status. He believes that he can give Yahweh tips on how to run the universe, and Yahweh is not interested in getting tips from us as to how to run things. He knows everything and we don't, and so when we disagree with Yahweh, that's the same thing as being wrong. The whole point of the book of Job is to say there are two stances that the person of faith can have. You can agree with Yahweh, and that's the same thing as being right, because Yahweh's always right. You can also disagree with Yahweh, and that's the same thing as being wrong, because Yahweh's always right. So when you're tempted to disagree with Yahweh, think of the book of Job, the answer is, you're wrong. If you think that Yahweh's punishments or chastisements or trials are capricious, you are even more wrong because you are justifying yourself in the same way that Job did, and you are presuming to judge God. What Elihu says, and this is certainly one of the core ideas of biblical monotheism, is that the Lord thy God is awesome and inscrutable and separate from you, and however he dispenses chastisement in history, it's your job is to deal with it, not to second-guess him. If you second-guess him, you're wrong. So Elihu brings us back to the tradition of biblical faith. And it's very interesting the colloquy that, that we get right after that, because as soon as Elihu goes and Job is on his own, we get a chat with Yahweh. Yahweh makes a personal appearance. Not personal in the sense that we get a burning bush this time. Yahweh talks to Job out of the whirlwind. And I must confess, this is one of my favorite images of the deity in the biblical tradition. Because what's more powerful and awesome and intimidating and bigger than you are than a tornado? Think about the fact that as a tornado approaches, there's little or nothing you can do. It's bigger than you are. It's stronger than you are. There's no way you could possibly contend with such a force. And in addition to the fact that it is awesome in its power, it is a, a living, not quite a living, but it is a, a dynamic symbol of chaos May I suggest that God speaking to Job out of the whirlwind is Yahweh talking to Job out of the realm of what appears to be moral chaos. The whirlwind is the simple brute facticity of history with which we are forced to deal. I would be inclined to say that Yahweh in the form of a whirlwind is the, the he is the God of the Hebrew Bible. This is the God that hardens Pharaoh's heart. This is the God that is the severe judge of all human transgressions. This is the God that we are frightened by and intimidated by. This is God as universal lawgiver. This is God as inscrutable force. This is God as being utterly separate, utterly different, utterly apart from humanity. It is only under the most unusual circumstances that this face of God makes itself manifest. On the whole, those who would get too close to the divine image die as a result of it. Moses is given a chance to see the burning bush. 
Job is given a chance to talk to God in the form of a whirlwind. But apart from extremely rare cases like that, such a close interaction with the divinity means that humanity just is crushed by the burden of absorbing God's awesome majesty. So here we have the whirlwind, and Job, covered with boils, sore afflicted, he's got all the problems in the world. His family's dead, his sheep are gone, he's got sores on his body, and his friends think they're better than he is. So that's kind of the icing on the cake. So he's sitting there amidst the dust and the ruins of his life, and a tornado comes up and starts talking to him. So it's going to be a bad day. And what does the tornado say? Tornado says, Where wert thou when I created the world? Speak if thou hast understanding. That's from the King James Version, if I remember correctly. But the idea is this. I'm Yahweh. I make mountains. I make planets. I make mackerel. I make oceans. I make everything. What do you know how to make? Nothing. All you do is complain. All you do is think you're justified. Yahweh is not pleased. It turns out that the little colloquy between Yahweh and Job suggests that Yahweh doesn't think that he's obligated to explain himself to worms like Job. There's a fine passage in chapter, I think it's chapter 25 of Job, where um, the human beings are, connect, are, are compared to maggots and worms in their relationship to Yahweh. And I think the, the gist of the book of Job is that human beings have a great deal more in common with maggots and worms than they do with the inscrutable divinity. And for the same reason that it would be presumptuous for a worm or a maggot to tell God how to run the universe, since maggots and worms don't know what's going on, it would probably be prudent and faithful and probably be appropriate for us not to make suggestions to Yahweh as to how he might run history. It turns out that if you believe Yahweh is there at all, one of the entailments, one of the concomitants of this idea is that everything happens for a providential reason. And it not only happens to other people, it also happens to you. So the point is then, if you believe in Yahweh, it is necessary to make a moral distinction between good and evil in the world. It is necessary to be able to distinguish between right and wrong, between the faithful adherence to Yahweh's commands and the rejection and alienation from Yahweh's commands. If you make that distinction, a, you must work on the assumption that you are not able to completely fulfill the terms of the covenant. In other words, you must make the assumption of your own sinfulness, of your own depravity in the eyes of Yahweh. This is one way of thinking about original sin. If that is the case, if people are intrinsically depraved, if they are only in fits and starts able to maintain their moral fidelity to the principles of Yahweh, then that means that in every case, for every person, under every circumstance, when bad stuff happens to us, we deserve it. We may not like it, we may not see the direct cause or connection, but there can be no question that Yahweh has his reasons. If you believe that Yahweh is there, and if you believe that his moral order really is universal, then it follows that you are not allowed to have any complaint against Yahweh. He does not want advice. Yahweh's thought it through already. When you are tempted to give him advice, Go back and read the book of Job. That is what the book of Job is for. It is to force you into an absolute and radical position of faith, which is a moral virtue unique to the tradition of Western monotheism, or certainly unique in its intensity. The Greeks would find this rather fanatical and rather excessive. But if you view the world as mysterious, if you view Yahweh as inscrutable, and if you hum view every human being as intrinsically depraved, then all the pieces of the puzzle come together. Then, although we have an incomplete understanding of the world, we have at least a black box, the mystery of Yahweh's providence, in which to throw all our uncertainties. And that means that once we have a way of shrugging off the burden of not understanding Yahweh's plan for the universe, we are also able to throw off the burden of justifying ourselves in God's eyes, it turns out that justifying oneself in God's eyes is superfluous because God already knows our moral status. It turns out that when Satan and God were talking upstairs in heaven or wherever it is that they uh, talk together, well, it turns out that God knew that although Job was going through the motions of being his faithful servant, deep inside, within the soul of Job, there was a certain unreconstructed pride in his status as God's faithful servant. There was a certain idea that he really deserved a house, or not a house because there aren't any then, but uh, that he deserved flocks and a family and the good things in life. After all, he had been going through the motions for this long. There's a sense in which Satan was not wrong in saying that Job's religious commitment, or at least part of it, is somewhat connected to the good things that Yahweh had given him.
might look at it this way. I don't know, if those of you who know uh, the moral philosophy of Immanuel Kant, the terminology will perhaps make more sense. Uh, what Satan is saying is that Job is heteronymous in the sense that he is caused to obey and go through the ritual observance of Yahweh's dictates on account of the fact that Yahweh gives him nice stuff. The proper stance, apparently, is to be faithful to Yahweh and to refuse to blaspheme against Yahweh regardless of what Yahweh offers you because Yahweh is justified whether he's giving you good things or evil things. Yahweh has his reasons. So for that reason, we are enjoined in the book of Job to an absolute position of faith that is unique Certainly not anything like the, the tradition we get out of Athens. And in addition to that, we are also enjoined to become Job-like, to become God's faithful servant and accept whatever it is that God dishes out to us in the same spirit of humility and in the same spirit of mystery. It's this mystery of suffering and the mystery of evil as it is introduced through an all-loving, monotheistic God that the problem of the book of Job addresses. And I'd be tempted to say that it, doesn't entirely, it isn't entirely satisfactory in its answering of the question. We ask again and again, why is there evil in the world? And it turns out that it's a dumb question, because Yahweh surely knows, and we surely don't, and unless Yahweh wants to tell us, we're not going to find out. In the interim, between now and the end of the world, or the final judgment of the world, or whenever it is Yahweh chooses to disclose the meaning of evil in this world, the proper position for us is absolute submission to the will of God. And Job instantiates that. He's the great image of the absolute life of faith. And he serves as a sort of icon for the great religious thinkers in the Western tradition. If those, those of you who know the work of, say, Blaise Pascal, or Soren Kierkegaard, these men are recapitulations of the Job story, the most ardent and powerful and deep of the interpreters of the Western religious tradition were the ones who tried to solve the problem of evil and good, who tried to offer a theodicy, who tried to comprehend God's mind, and then in a spirit of humility and in a using a philosophy of resignation, threw up their hands and said, I give up, and I guess that's not the problem, that's the solution. In other words, it's telling human beings what their moral boundaries are, what the perimeter of their possible knowledge is that defines the human condition. What Yahweh is doing for us here is insisting on two ideas which are in a certain degree of tension. God is a moral God who creates a universal moral law, and yet we can never completely understand the way in which this moral law is realized here in the world. It turns out then that the philosophy of resignation that's instantiated in the book of Job is probably the greatest religious icon or image or symbol that is introduced by the Hebrew Bible into the Western tradition of art and literature.